Hey there, Akuma fans. Charlie with the Gossiger Applications staff. Hey, congratulations. You got your brand new Akuma Turning Center on the floor. P300L control, state-of-the-art, ready to rock and roll, and we're eager to make some chips, right? Well, hold up. We're going to do a little work on this first. We're going to get in and configure some of the parameters so the machine will behave in a standard way that, uh, that we can predict. This is usually something that an applications engineer will do for you as soon as your machine hits the floor, but hey, you and me, we want to make some money here, so we are going to jump in even before the apps guy arrives. So let's take a look at our control panel out here, and, and we'll make a few, uh, a few minor alterations to the factory set parameters, and um, we'll talk about each one and what it does as we go through. You probably already know that on the keys up on top of the control panel, that's these guys right here. We want the parameter key. Hey, that's what we're talking about, right? Parameters that control the way the machine's going to behave for us. As soon as I push this, I get the parameter screen, but I'm not certain which category of parameter I'll be looking at. There is a screen. A, a screen out feature that allows you to temporarily remove some of the parameters from the available menu. That way you can lock them out or just hide them so they don't get tampered with. We want to make sure that's fully open right now. So what I want you to do is come over to F8 display change. We'll touch that. It gives us a pop-up window that shows us the list, the active list of parameter pages that are available for this. But first, before I even start to monkey around with it, I'm going to find this black arrow key right here, arrow to the right. And now the population field for F1 will be menu change. When I touch that, here's how we can screen out parameters so that they're not shown on a daily basis. I don't want to do that right now. I want everything to be available. So make sure there's a check mark in the word all display. If there is a check mark up here, then it's irrelevant whether or not some of the other items are not checked. They're still going to show up in our, our master list. When we're done, we'll push OK. And now we have the full list. Every parameter the machine has available is right there on top. I'm going to close this down now so that we can just use F6 and F7 item up and item down to scroll through some of these parameters. There's several pages right in the beginning we want. When we go to skip, uh, skip a few pages, then we'll use the display change select function. There's really nothing for us to do in the common variable page. That's going to be for macros once we get a little more familiar with the machine. So let's item down a first time and we have our user parameters. These are the soft limits. And I have a few other videos on the channel that talk about barriers and soft limits. So uh, we'll skip over this guy as well. But uh, it is very handy if you don't want the turret to say retract all the way to the upper right hand extremity of the machine before indexing tools and coming back in to make a cut. Uh, check out the video, I believe I called it uh, user barrier, or eh, just look at the channel. So let's item down. Page number three here is where we can select whether we're running in inch or metric. In our case, yeah, okay, we're going to do the inch thing. If I were to change it, it's simply highlight the length unit system, touch menu, and then you can select whether you're doing inch or metric. Uh, I do look down and visually confirm that these uh, length values are all set to one. That's so that uh, that will change if we had the micronic control, but in our case, uh, we're good. Uh, usually the factory has that set properly right off the bat, so we won't we won't stress on it. Item down again, our gauging data. If you have a probe, that's a whole different barrel of monkeys. Let's leave that one alone too. The next two pages are for your RS-232 if you choose to use that. I don't have any uh, videos on that right now because RS-232, especially on an Akuma, seems a little outdated, especially since we can network the, uh, uh, network the control to our corporate server. Hey, there's got to be a video on that, right? Yeah, check out the channel. Okay, so now our next page 
Ooh, volume control there. <clears throat> Our next page here is for load monitoring. The only real change I make to this page is this guy right here, the upper end of load trace display. I have several videos on the load monitoring function. Feel free to look at them, but just uh, trust me when I say changing that from 200% to 150, basically it shortens up your load monitor and um, uh, the just the gauge so that you're only displaying to 150% or you're probably not gonna run up to 200%. So that's change number, uh, what, three, four, wherever the heck we are now. Item down again, load monitor two, I'm good. Three, touch setter, engaging. I'm just scrolling through until I find multiple machining. If you don't have an M machine, no live tooling machine, you can go ahead and skip over this portion. But if we have live tooling, we definitely want to come back and uh, take a look at this. First off, the multi-cycle return point. This is where a tool will retract from a, uh, a compound hole like a G183 or a tapping G184. This is where the tool will retract prior to indexing the part to a subsequent hole. If it's set to cutting start point, that means it's only gonna to retract to your R plane before indexing the part, which can cause you some problems if your part's square. So I like to make sure this is cycle start point, which means that we are gonna start at wherever the tool was delivered prior to calling the G183, G184, instead of being right next to the part. So let's switch that, make sure it's at cycle start point. I usually leave everything alone until I get to the G184, G298 tapping. This one, Akuma has given us two G codes for uh, live tool tapping. One is designed for rigid, one is design, designed for floating, and floating holder. And if you think about it, why would those two need to be different? Why would I need to have uh, one cycle for rigid and one for floppy? Won't a rigid do both? So uh, I like to make G184 a concurrent tap. This way, it doesn't matter whether you use G178 or G184, they will both do exactly the same thing. From the factory setting, it's expecting if you're holding the tool in a rigid collet that you're gonna use G178 and a floating holder will be G184. Most post processors are already using G184, so we'll make that rigid. Let's scroll down a little bit on this multiple machining page and see if we come across anything else that we want to talk about. Here's a good one. C-axis clamp and unclamp in Hall Pro. This one is one that I'll leave up to you guys as to whether to set or not to set. Let's imagine we're doing a round part that has holes, four holes at the quadrants. This unclamp in Hall Pro, basically what it will do is it will automatically, when you are doing a modal can cycle, G183 at C0, C90, C180, what it will do is it will automatically fire the brake, drill the hole. When the tool is done, before it will then release the brake, index the C, refire the brake, and drill. And it'll do this without you ever using any of the G or the M codes for spindle break. So this is why I call it a preference. Some people think, hey, that's great. Other people think, wait a second, I'm adding two seconds, maybe two and a half seconds to the uh, drill cycle in between each hole because it's got a, a clamp, drill, unclamp, rotate, clamp. So if you are to if you are to set this from effect, which means I'm going to automatically clamp and unclamp my spindle to no effect, right off the bat, you're going to get a, uh, uh, an alarm that says, hey, we have to reset. There are several that we're going to do throughout this video that are gonna require a reset or a power on, power off situation. So we're just gonna ignore that right now and move on just knowing that we're gonna cycle power and that's gonna take care of all of our, uh, take care of all of our issues. Scrolling through the rest of multiple machine, 
Let's jog down. I could have sworn there was one more I wanted, but um, let's just go ahead and skip over. I'm sure it's going to come to me sooner or later, and it'll probably get get bit. Okay, the next uh, next parameter page we want to talk about is the optional parameter spindle synchro tap. This is exactly the same issue that I just described five minutes ago regarding uh, rigid tapping. Whether you're using G77, G78, or you are um, utilizing a different code for rigid versus um, floating. I always change that to concurrent. Doesn't matter if I'm using a floating holder, still I want the machine to uh, behave as if it's a rigid tap. One click down, we've got the work weight main and sub. Now, Akuma has several different sets of parameters that we can use to control servo acceleration and deacceleration. And um, these are the main categories right here. How much weight do we have hanging on the main or the sub spindle? When it comes from the factory, usually it's set to no chuck, which is what I would do if I had a collet nose, something with not a whole lot of inertia that I need to worry about. But if I were using a chuck or some kind of fixture, I can highlight the word no chuck, use the select, and now you can see the gross categories that we're talking about. And let's do a 10 inch chuck on this puppy dog. And of course the sub spindle has the same, same items that we can deal with. Uh, once you've got the gross category set, by selecting what standard uh, fixture you're using. That's where we can use the um, servo navi function. Oh man, that's a big word. <laughs> we'll do a video on that at a later date when I'm in front of a machine because it's really cool. The machine can literally measure the inertia on the spindle and make, uh, make fine adjustments to the gross category that you see right here. Item down, no robot loader, fixed cycle, we're good, easy op. Factory does a pretty good job of making sure that these are already set right, but I do like to make sure that my tool list, my MDI input, and my tool restart function are all set to effect. This just means that I've got the easy op shortcuts from the main screen that uh, I talked about on another video. Uh, there is some more down here on the bottom, but for the most part, I rarely have to monkey with those. VSST, okay, now here's one of the most important ones, the other function. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that is not really categorized uh, in, a, in a way that's logical. The, just about everything shows up in this other function page. So let's weed through it and I'm gonna find two or three of them that you and I are gonna to wanna to use. First off, number 25, program start mode requires. This is uh, from the factory generally set to op, which means when I hit cycle start on the machine, I must be looking at this screen. If I happen to be looking at the tool data screen or one of the others, if I were to press cycle slam at this point, nothing would happen, it would just, it, it would sit. It requires you to be looking at this screen before you hit cycle slam. So if that sounds like a good idea for you, go ahead and leave it in op. My choice is to say nothing because this means if I push the green button, it means I want to make money. I don't give a rat's butt what I'm looking at. Run the machine. And we'll scroll down a little further and find our two, 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 two. Okay, here's a good one. Anybody ever use M695? That's the uh, harmonic spindle speed control where you will fluctuate your RPM to avoid chatter in a turn. If you do not populate these fields right here, you are going to get a uh, you can get an alarm right off the bat when you try to command M695. This is where the default parameters for the M695 will uh, will show up. It's where it, it extracts the the information. So I, in general, like to say the amplitude of spindle rever. Uh, amplitude change for spindle rev. I, in general, like to set that at 20. And we'll set that at 10. 
and we'll leave the interval timer at zero. At the risk of wasting a parameter video describing harmonic spindle speed control, basically what this is, 20% is the amount that you're allowing the spindle RPM to deviate uh, during the M695 function. The cycle of change for spindle reverse is the amount of time it takes to make a complete uh, sine wave. Plus 20%, minus 20%, back to zero will take one second. So yeah, then you can change that. And the interval is how long do you want to dwell at the highs and the lows of the sine wave? So by putting in 20, 10, and zero, that may not be perfect for every M695 cut, but what it will do is it will give you a base parameter from which to start and modify them as, you, as needed. There is one, I think there's only one more here that I usually do. And this one is extremely important when you're doing small parts. Rapid droop control. What this is, the machine gives itself permission when you're rapiding in uh, multiple axes. It gives itself some permission, some leeway to blur some corners. Let's say I've got a rapid in X plus and then I want to rapid in Z plus. My command is a sharp corner here. Well, the machine gives itself permission to kind of blur that a little bit. Well, if you're doing small parts and you were say doing a groove, when you commanded that X Z motion, there's a chance if you didn't pull out far enough, you could blur the corner of the part right here. Rapid droop control, if you set that to effect from the factory no effect, it will, um, uh, it will take away that permission. It doesn't hurt your cycle time. It just says, hey, I want you to go right to where I told you and quit blurring corners. Very, very good one. Um, if you have a y-axis machine with uh, y-axis turning, that's the ability to move the y-axis above or below the spindle turning position in order to compensate for a tool that's not, not right on center. Here's another one that you'll probably want. This move axis for order, move only axis for order, what that means is um, Akuma, when you engage or disengage a cutter compensation and then command only one axis, it will move all of the axes in order to maintain the tool position before the cutter comp was brought into play. Whoa, what does that mean? Okay, let's say my part's sitting here and my tool is up on top. If I told it I want to cancel the cutter compensation, it was engaged in Z here, and then I want to move in X. Well, the machine says that my Z is here on the end of the part, but as soon as I cancel cutter comp, it'll be back here. And so even though I only command X, I'm going to see two axes of, of, of motion, which in that case could cause a major problem. So what I want to do is I want to remove that, that permission by saying move only axis for order. No, I want to say affect it. Only do what I tell you to do. Don't, don't try to think ahead of me. And if I do select effect in the move only for axis, I also want to go down below and say display warning for axis motion, not display. Otherwise, every time the machine doesn't do that little compensation thing, it's going to flash a message up on my screen that looks like this big red bar here that says moving only axis ordered. <clears throat> and yeah, okay, fine. But you don't have to tell me you did it. It's like a two-year-old. Oh, did I say that out loud? Ah, my kids are going to be uh, upset at me. Let's see if there's anything else down here. I'm going to zip, 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 zip because there's a couple of things that I always check. Usually the factory does pretty well with it, but I want to make sure that, um, that it's done. On this machine, it's not. So I zipped all the way down to machine user parameter, turret door. And here, 
turret short path control A side. What this means is because it is not check marked right now, my turret is only going to index in the clockwise direction. So if I'm going from tool two to tool one, it's gonna go the long way around. I don't want that. So we'll put a check mark in there. If I have an LT machine, a twin turret, then I'll do the same for the, uh, for the B side. But in my case, I don't need it. And just about everything else here, I believe, let's see if there's, uh, do you have a parts catcher? If you do, you will probably want to page down to the parts catcher and make sure that you check mark your spindle interlock release. This is a little weird to me, but there is an interlock that says if the spindle is rotating, I won't deploy the parts catcher. Don't we have to cut the part off to make it caught? I don't know. I guess if we were ejecting slugs, it, it could happen. There's a use for everything, right? And the other, uh, the other, if you've got a W axis machine, a sub spindle, you definitely want to check the interlock release for the um, uh, ZB motion for your lower turret. Not an LT? Yeah, don't worry about it. And I believe that's going to do it for us. We've got everything that at least now make our machine functional. Uh, the, 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 we will cycle power to get rid of our alarms here. Reset would get rid of the reset necessary, but I still have that power on effective from having changed rapid droop control. The only other thing I set up when um, uh, when I'm putting a new machine on the floor is A, the X0 center line. I have a video on that on my channel, please check it out. And also calibrating the touch setter. I don't have a video for that yet, but uh, I will as soon as I get uh, near a machine with my camera. So if you have any questions, please call your local Gossiger application staff, like, subscribe, do the whole YouTube thing, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Have a good one.